Tonight's conversation with the Eugene and Marilyn Glick Indiana Authors Award honoree Maurice Brodus is part of the Indiana Authors Award Speaker Program, powered by Indiana Humanities and made possible through the generosity of Glick Philanthropies. An accidental teacher at the Oaks Academy Middle School, an accidental librarian, the school library manager, which is part of the NDPL shared system, and a purposeful community organizer, the resident Afrofuturist at the Capru Institute, Maurice is a Renaissance man whose work spans genres and mediums. Maurice has a dozen novels and nearly 100 short stories in print. His Naptown-based steampunk novel, Pimp My Airship, earned him an Indiana Authors Award through the Indiana Humanities. Through his urban fantasy trilogy, Naptown-based stories, steampunk novels, and middle-grade detective stories, he beautiful, beautifully creates, as Cherie Renee Thomas claims, fascinating characters mm. across lifetimes, fierce voices that linger and stay with you. Beyond fascinating, his characters are evocative and demand empathy. His YA novel, The Usual Suspects, helped my son better understand the inner workings of his own school's social landscape. For that, I am very grateful. Karen Lord asks us to give thanks for these griot, hip-funk, Afrofuturist stories of pure horror and complicated hope. Complicated hope is a theme we just talked about at our book group here. She claims broadest sounds a deep beat in this true myth of survival. What our heads forget, our bones remember. Mm. Mm. Want to know more about his gaming work, his role as an editor, or his project and adaptation for a television show? I could talk for too long, so I invite you to go online to mauricebroadus.com. Now, please help me welcome award-winning author, community organizer, teacher, and Afrofuturist, Maurice Broadus. Thank you. Thank you. Great, now I gotta live up to all of that. <laughs> mm. So, uh, we're gonna talk about uh, discovering Afrofuturism. What does Afrofuturism e even mean, right? And uh, by the way, thank you for having me. Let me start there. Thank you for having me. Hmm? We're so great. Oh, no. <laughs> thank you. Um, so I am the resident Afrofuturist at the Kepler Institute, okay? And I love introducing myself as the resident Afrofuturist there because people like to just nod, like they know what that means. They're like, oh, you're the resident Afrofuturist? Yeah, yeah. I'm like, okay, yeah. Um, so the way I like to think about it is like, so many, many organizations have like futurists on staff, right? Um, and they do what's called, a, I believe the term is strategic foresight thinking. And it's basically, you know, that sort of examining our society and technology and the world as, as it stands right now to sort of like extrapolate these uh, blueprints and maps to the future. But with an Afrofuturist lens, you know, this visioning is rooted in like black history and culture to create a vivid picture of, the, of what the world could look like. And so... Okay, I don't know if you know much about Kepler. So the Kepler Institute basically is a, is a grassroots community organization, and we do a lot of uh, leadership training, leadership development, you know, just sort of training up young people to be the change agents in our community. All right, so we use like various social enterprises to just act like learning labs for them. It both helps fund the organization and just also, hey kids, go do the thing. And uh, we'll figure it out together how, how this is gonna go. Uh, but the whole philosophy is about community wealth building and using community wealth building to help create the world we want to see. So in a lot of ways, the organization does work what, uh, sort of like applied Afrofuturism. So we do this visioning and then we apply it to the community work that we do. And, and it's sort of like, it's our mindset. It's a mindset both as us as an organization and as a community. You know, we want to be thinking about these desired future states and we want to go through this world in a way that we're just constantly reimagining, re you know, the way we move through the community, the way we move through the world. And, uh, and, and part of that is because, you know, as I've been sort of thinking about this a bit, like we live in a culture that doesn't value imagining as a skill set, right? So, I mean, me as a writer, me even at, at the school, me at, the, in, at Capra as an Afrofuturist, you know, I'm, I'm in this state of just constant daydreaming. And that's a good thing. You know, give, carving out time and space for me to just dream about possibilities. Uh, we live in a, in, in a world that has systems that are, are past the point of just being able to just reform them. 
A lot of our systems can't be reformed, but they can be reimagined. And that's where we like to live. That's the hard work we're doing here. That's the hard work we are doing here together, right? So, and, but it's also the work we've always done. Okay. We, just, uh, we just didn't have really a name for it. And so I was gonna talk about, so Afrofuturism as a name was first coined by Mark Derry uh, in 1993. And it's sort of like, a, in, in, he's an academic and he was just viewing this as a, like a literary and cultural aesthetic that just combines elements of science fiction and historical fiction, fantasy and Afrocentrism. Um, and it, but it goes by many names. So like if we're talking about here in North America, we refer to Afrofuturism. In Brazil, they refer to something called, oh, refer to something, refer to this as Afrofuturismo. Uh, on, the, on the mother continent, it's known as Afro, uh, African Futurism, which is a, a term that was first coined by uh, uh, Dr. Pamela Sundstrom in her article, The Afro, uh, Afro Mythology and African Futurism, it was, uh, in, in 2013. And uh, uh, Dr. Nadia Korfor has since popularized that term. But like I said, we go by many names, Caribbean Futurism. I've heard Afritopia, which I'm like, huh, okay. Um, which sounded more like a fruit snack. But we have many, I keep forgetting, I'm like on camera. I was like, this is actually recorded, so. It's all good. All right. But anyway, we have all these different names for, for what it is. But we keep coming back to Afrofuturism. So, all right, so this will be the interactive portion of this conversation. When I say Afrofuturism, what do you think of? Octavia. Okay. Octavia. Okay. What did you say? Black Panther. Black Panther? Yeah. Did you have your hand up? So much of you know what we see is from the white perspective. So mm -hmm. Yeah, right. So. In, innovation um, from a Afrocentric perspective. Oh, I like that. I like that. So yeah, so so we start with Black Panther, right? Um, I love it. it comes out this week. The sequel comes out this week. <laughs> so I'm in this space. I saw the first Black Panther three times. Uh, uh, in this initial run, only the first two times I dressed up in appropriate costume. <laughs> but P Black Panther is what brought Afro the term Afrofuturism to the, to the popular mindset, right? Before then, it was like, like I said, this was a, a term coined in 93, but all of a sudden, in the last couple of years, all of a sudden, Afrofuturism is hot. Um, I, I love this quote by Janelle Monet. Afrofuturism is me, us, as black people, seeing ourselves in the future, being as magical as we want to be, we get to point to a different world on our terms. Oh no, we get to paint a different world on our terms. I get to be whatever I want to be through Afrofuturism. And so yeah, so actually I'm gonna, gonna talk about all of your, your definitions here, but Afrofuturism is, is uses art. You know, it could be visual art, music, uh, film, literature, fashion, to create this framework to examine our present that's rooted in history, but looks to the future. Right? So it does, yes, it mixes science fiction and social justice. It leverages uh, our ancestral intelligence. It imagines the future through art and through the lens of black experience. And it's rooted in black people having a better future for ourselves on our terms. Because to overcome the way society remains unequal, there has to be visions of a future where these problems are solved. Um, Samuel Delaney put it this way, we need images of tomorrow and our people need them more than most. So, Afrofuturism is rooted in the past, you know, history that unites our stories. Afrofuturism critiques our present situation, and Afrofuturism provides glimpses of what's, what possible futures might look like. Um, writer uh, Tanana Reeve Du, uh, to paraphrase what she said, she says, the act of dreaming about ourselves in the future is an act of resistance. So Afrofuturism is about remembering, resilience, and resistance. But no matter what it's called, it's the intersection of the black cultural lens with art, technology, and liberation. It's the African diaspora creating a framework to critique the past and dream of possible futures, and it's a bridge connecting the past to the future. Um, there's this uh, African term, uh, Sankofa. Actually, it's a word from the Twi language that means go back and get it. Or it's not taboo to fetch that which is at risk of being left behind. 
And so we see Afrofuturism in, in all sorts of different things. We see it in the canvases of, of Jean-Michel uh, Michel Basquiat. Uh, we see it in the photography of Rene Cox. Um, I'm going to focus tonight on like three principal areas, music, literature, and film. All right, so like I said, and it, we'll start with music. So like I said, black people have always been futurists from the moment we arrived on the continent. You know, in order to find ways of being innovative and resilient, you know, we took hymns from a religion forced on us and used them to forecast a free, uh, a future free of slavery. And, and that mindset sort of, it's, it's woven its way into all aspects of, of our music. Uh, I, I look at uh, one, of the, one of the main progenitors for me when I think about Afrofuturism, Sun Ra, right? So am I familiar with Sun Ra? Okay. Oh, good, because if you read my book, you're going to see a lot of uh, Sun Ra references in, in that book. Um, but so in 1936, 1937, he had this vision, this sort of visionary experience. Um, yeah, I, I think about it. a lot of these artists tend to have these visionary experiences. Uh, nope, never mind. I was going to go down a bad rabbit hole. Um, <laughs> but uh, he was at, in college, and I'm sure this was a drug-free environment. But he was transported to Saturn a, as part of this experience. Um, and there, when he was present at, in Sat, at Saturn, in Saturn, Saturn, uh, he was informed that uh, he would going to he uh, that he would speak through his music, and this and so his career be be began in the 1950s. And so for much of his career, he led this group called the Orchestra. Right, and and if you see any pictures of him, he has a, his wardrobe is is completely tied to this idea of his ancient asset ancestors in Egypt, but he fundamentally believed that the future of black or for black people would be intergalactic. So he had uh, one of the seminal albums of Afrofuturism uh, was his album uh, Space is the Place in uh, 1973. Um, there was also a movie Space is the Place, which. I'm pretty convinced you will get a contact high from watching. Uh, so, uh, but, I mean, it's well worth watching, but whew, it's a lot. Um, but then, so, that, so we got uh, Sun Ra in the 1950s. In the 1970s, we got Parliament Funkadelic, the rise of Parliament Funkadelic. Um, and then this is, again, so with George Clinton, the, the founder of Parliament Funkadelic, he, he's combining his love of things like the outer limits um, and also the fact that uh, he and Bootsy Collins, the, the bassist uh, of the, the group, encountered a UFO. <sighs> and a lot of drugs. I've been, there, there's a, there is that theme there. Uh, I watched this one uh, documentary on them and the amount of drugs they did through the decades. It's like it changed with each decade what their, their drug of choice was. But somehow they were uh, encountered a UFO. Uh, and in, at, when they were present at the UFO, the mothership was angry with us, well, with them, for giving up the funk without permission, right? So that became, that became part of their mission uh, as, as a group and, and with all their music. So it combined like this civil rights movement and this, uh, this notion of that we shall overcome in order to create this positive future. Um, because in his future, the struggle's over and we've won. Right? And so this is the mythology that begins in earnest with the, the album The Mothership Connection. Um, but in this worldview, funk is seen as a path of, to enlightenment. Uh, in uh, 1977, their album Funk and Teleki versus the Placebo Syndrome, whew, uh, in their first track, Bob Gun, uh, Endangered Species, you know, it weaponizes funk as a sort of self-protective device. So George Clinton said this, we had, to, we had put black people in situations nobody ever thought they would be in, like the White House. I figured another place you wouldn't think black people would be was in outer space. Um, I was a big fan of Star Trek, and we did a thing with a pimp sitting in a spaceship shaped like a Cadillac. And then we did all these James Brown type grooves, but with street talk and ghetto slang. So uh, in my world, we call that world building. And, uh, and they were great world builders. And uh, again, you, you'll see a lot of their influence in literature. I know th they've been huge influences on my work. Um, but again, it all starts with this mythology that we create about ourselves, the story we tell about ourselves into the future, this journey into the stars for ourselves. Um, speaking of which, uh, so we did the 50s, we did the 70s, we'll go now to the 90s, uh, Outcast, uh, Andre 3000, um, one of my favorite groups, so uh, one of their albums is called uh, uh, Aquameni, uh, and uh, one of their lead, uh, lead tracks was called AT Aliens. 
uh, ATL for uh, Atlanta, where they're from, and then uh, aliens. So it's a portmanteau of th those two words. But basically, it depicts outcasts, you know, the story of them feeling disconnected from the world that they live in uh, as they're trying to celebrate, you know, their past, their roots in, in Atlanta. But they're dreaming of this future, right? This future that, uh, because they don't want the one that they're trapped in because uh, this society that's been created for them is just not meant for them. And it's largely because of their race. So they're always, they start dreaming of this new world, this better world where they can be themselves. Then we have uh, Janelle Monet, who, uh, uh, I love Janelle Monet. Um, and uh, one of the things I really appreciate about her is this, uh, the, 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 I mean, talk about world building. Uh, she, I think she originally envisioned this album series because it was called Metropolis. Um, I think the first album was uh, Metropolis Suite One, uh, but it was all based on the 1927 film Metropolis, you know, a silent film. So she got her inspiration starting there. And she'd envisioned, I think, this nine album suite of uh, what was going to be delving into, into the story. But uh, it all follows this uh, fictional uh, character of Cindy Mayweather. She's this messianic android, and she's been sent back in time to free the citizens of Metropolis from what she calls the Great Divide, which is a secret society that uh, uses time travel to suppress freedom and love. It's a lot, and I love it. And this is also when Prince became a huge fan of hers, uh, and he becomes one of her mentors. I'm also a huge Prince fan. Uh, but and so you know, fast forward a couple of years, you know, she releases uh, her first uh, full-length album, uh, which and uh, let's see, what's it, the Arch Android, which basically is the second and third uh, movements of her suite. Um, I'm trying to condense this down, I'm just like, do not sound like a, a Janelle Monae stand right now. Um, <clears throat> But I mean, even with her, uh, the first single from that from the Electric Lady album, Queen, you know, it's her and Erica Badu, another known Afrofuturist. Uh, uh, you see a lot of Afrofuturism in her music. You know, the two of them combine uh, their talents to, you know, start telling the story. Um, the centers African American women. Um, in fact, and then in 2018, she released an album called A Dirty Computer. Uh, and again, we're going to see these things where it's like, oh yes, we, we start in one genre, but we can't help but like leap to another uh, art form because Dirty Computer, while it was a, its own album, it, she also released uh, this, what she called uh, an emotion picture that goes along with it, which was uh, like a 49 minute video uh, that goes along, uh, alongside it. Um, and again, it, it just follows this, uh, this uh, Afrofuturist setting. You had a woman, her name is uh, Jane57821. Uh, who's trying to escape the, the systems that, that govern the, the, her society. So again, we see this imagery it starts to weave its way through music. Um, artists such as Beyonce and Missy Elliott and uh, go back to Grace Jones, to Salam Knowles and, and Rihanna. We see these things, these images of, of people wrestling with this idea of Afrofuturism and, and what this could mean for us. I feel like I'm talking really fast. So let me know if you have any questions. Just raise your hand, or you, I'll just keep going. Just keep going. Just, I'm just going to keep going. All right, so never mind all of that. So we'll move to literature. And again, we talk about Mark, Mark uh, Derry uh, and, and him uh, lament. So when he wanted, when he coined Afrofuturism, it actually boiled down to a lament that he was having. Because <clears throat> he was looking around the, the, the science fiction literature scene, and he was just like, you know, African Americans, it's like, what's it, one, two, three, they're, seem to be only four African Americans working in this area. And he name checks Samuel Delaney, Octavia Butler, Charles Saunders, and Stephen Barnes. Um, and basically they were holding it down for all of us. And so he was, so that was his lament. That's where it came from. Um, and so uh, that was it for like all his black speculative fiction. And while he coined the turn in, in 93, and his lament was uh, due to a survey of the scene at the time. Again, it's the work we've always done, right? So uh, one of the earliest Afrofuturist tales was uh, written by Mark Delaney, uh, who's actually a US politician. Um, but he began publishing Blake, or uh, The Huts of America, and that's, this was back in 1859. And it was a serial in a magazine. But it was about a successful slave revolt in the southern states and the founding of a new black country in Cuba, right? So then we move forward a little bit to Charles Chestnut, um, and this was the, the first known speculative fiction collection written by a person of color with his uh, book, The Conjure Woman. 
um, Frances Harper, again, we're still back in 1892. And, this, and uh, she writes Iola Leroy, which is the first piece of African-American utopian fiction. And, it, and what did it do? It envisioned equality between men and women, black people and white people, and for, uh, former slaves, or the, formerly the enslaved, and white folks. You know, this is the, the dream that she was writing from. W.E.B. Du Bois, science fiction writer. But not too many people know this. He had a, uh, he, I think, he, well, he did ha definitely had the story called The Comet, uh, which was uh, published in uh, Sri Renee Thomas's uh, seminal work, Dark Matter. Um, and it's a short story, um, and it's about a, a black man and a white woman who, su who survived this uh, apocalyptic event. Um, but he was a sci you know, well-known science, uh, not a well-known uh, civil rights activist, also a science fiction writer. They fuel one another. What's he doing? He's dreaming of a, of, of a different future. He's dreaming of possibilities, and that impacts who he is as an activist. Um, I think they recently discovered a second story of his only a couple years ago, uh, a second science fiction story of his, and I can't remember where it got published, but again, we see that, you know, he's a dreamer. Uh, we talk about folks like uh, Zora Neale Hurston. Uh, she uh, had two collections, which were largely collections of uh, African American and Caribbean folk folklore and folk magic. Um, so again, we don't normally think of her as an Afrofuturist, but this is the work. Um, things kind of get a little sketchy because her, like she was in the, she was a Harlem Renaissance powerhouse, and so then uh, the history of uh, uh, of the role of African Americans in literature becomes a little. Um, a little hard to track, frankly. Um, uh, noted uh, author and librarian uh, Jess Nev uh, Nevins, he pointed out that uh, a fully accurate history of black speculative fiction would be impossible to write because very little is known of the dime novel authors of the 19th century and the pulp magazine writers of the early 20th, uh, early 20th century, including notably their ethnicity. I'm, I'm currently reading a book called uh, Black Pulp. I just started it, but I mean, it, it, start, it does that investigation of who were the writers of this time because there's not a lot of documents. And so there's a, in Black Pope, they do an investigation trying to track down who were some of the writers during this, this time period, which is why we end up skipping to the 70s with uh, Ishmael Reed um, in his book Mumbo Jumbo. Um, we think of Toni Morrison, who we don't normally think of. I mean, you don't hear her bandied about as a, as a genre writer. I mean, we claim her. But uh, she's not commonly bandied around. Partly, uh, so I mean, if you look at Song of Solomon, you know, it's it builds on this uh, the, these sort of persistent legends of how black folks escaped enslavement by flying back to Africa, and then the personal story of the descendant of one of those left behind. That's Song of Solomon, right? Her book Beloved invokes the, the supernatural while recounting the la the lasting effects of of chattel slavery on black people, and that won the Pulitzer. Um, which is why the literary folks claim her and the, you know, she gets lost in the shuffle of speculative fiction writers. But then we then we do, we, we skip to the, uh, the folks that uh, Mark Derry name check. We got Sam, Samuel Delaney uh, with his, uh, I think the, the first book of his was The Jewels of Aptor, uh, which came out in like 1962. Um, but, you know, he was a, a seminal force in, in the genre. Uh, Dahlgren is one of probably his most noted Afrofuturist books. Came out in uh, 1975. But, uh, Another thing was his, he did this really famous essay called Racism and Science Fiction, um, which has been reprinted a bunch of times where he just like does his own survey of the scene and like, look, these are the systems, these are the things w that we are working in and working against um, as a group. Charles Saunders, um, he, he wrote um, Sword and Sorcery. So basically just imagine if Conan was black. That was Charles Saunders' work. Um, his main character was named Amaro. Um, and I think, I think he did either three or five novels based around Amaro. Um, Stephen Barnes, who, uh, let's see, he, he did the novel Lion's Blood and its sequel Zulu Heart, which were alternate histories uh, set in a world where there was this flip-flop. So the European population was decimated by the Black Plague, um, and then, uh, so the world was colonized, the, uh, the world that was colonized was done by China and North Africa. So you have this uh, really intriguing alternate history that, that he does in, in his works. And then uh, uh, someone named Octavia Butler. So we just get past her. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, no, so Octavia Butler, she was the first science fiction writer to win the MacArthur uh, Fellowship, you know, what we call the Genius Grant. She was the first, uh, first sci-fi writer to win that. Uh, her best known novels is, uh, is Kindred. Um, and that was actually written in response to some of her students, you know, making disparaging remarks about their enslaved ancestors, you know, and I can already hear that conversation because I hear it sometimes in my middle school students. Like, well, if I was back then, well, I wish someone would have hit me with a whip. I'm like, yo, you have never had a, or even seen a whip in action, if you think that's the case. Um, but it's basically about a, a modern black woman who's drawn involuntarily back, into, back in time, uh, uh, to uh, back in, uh, back in time to the time of enslavement, uh, enduring that, uh, ensuring that, that this white, it's a complicated story, but she has to ensure that this white supremacist lives in order that her grandmother gets born. So it's a complex re uh, wrestling with a lot of feelings uh, in, in the course of that story. Um, then uh, her next uh, next big seminal work uh, is a parable of the sower, um, set in the 2020s when. Uh, <laughs> Uh, where society is largely collapsing due to climate change and a growing wealth inequity and corporate greed. Again, all this written in 1993. Um, so yeah, the work of a futurist in action. But uh, you have this young lady who possesses this gift of uh, hyper empathy and she begins to develop this new belief system uh, which she calls Earthseed and um, has, to has to navigate this basically this dystopian world at, at this time. Um, but again, she, uh, this, uh, Lauren, the character in there, she believes that humanity's destiny is to travel beyond Earth and to live on other planets, right? So yeah, so uh, we all, you know, a lot of us point to Octavia as a major influence on us. Um, but right now we're still in the major, we're in, in the middle of a major uh, black speculative fiction boom, right? Um, I, I refer to the Queen Ends, uh, Nalo Hopkinson, uh, beginning with her book uh, Brown Girl in the, R in the Ring, um, Nisi Shaw, uh, who's, she had a collection called Filter House, um, but she just came out uh, only a couple years ago with uh, Everfair, which is her steampunk novel set in an alternate history of the Congo, and I know the sequel is due to, well, she's doing the edits to the sequel right now, so, but it's, it's coming out soon, and then uh, N.K. Jemison. Sorry, that was my moment of silence for N.K. Jemison. That's, that's my hero right there. Um, her debut novel, um, The Hundred Thousand Kingdoms, was the first volume in her uh, fantasy series called The Inheritance Trilogy. It was nominated for the uh, Nebula in, uh, in, the, in 2010, uh, shortlisted for the Tip Tree Award. It was nominated for a host, host of awards. But uh, she came out with a book called The Fifth Season in, uh, yeah, in 2015. And uh, it was the first volume in her Broken Earth series. And it, uh, and it takes place on, on, a, on a planet that has a single supercontinent known as the Stillness. And every few centuries, uh, all the inhabitants have to endure what's called the fifth season, which is their catastrophic climate change. Um, so in 2016, fifth season won uh, the Hugo Award for Best Novel, making her the first African-American uh, writer to win the Hugo in that category. Then she releases The Obelisk Gate, and then The Stone Sky, which each of those won the Hugo Award for Best Novel. So she became the first writer, period, to three-peat uh, on that award. Um, and like I said, there's a lot of, uh, like I said, we're in a boom, so I'm, I don't have time to just uh, name, you know, drop a bunch of names, but I mean, notably, I want to mention Colson uh, Whitehead uh, and his uh, Underground Railroad, um, Cherie Renee Thomas uh, with Dark Matter, uh, Mo, uh, Walter Mosley, he had a collection called Futureland, and that was actually, that book probably had the biggest impact on me as a writer, because that was the first time I encountered Afrofuturism. You know, I, I read that, I, at the time, I, I, I was, still, I was uh, still largely a horror writer at the time, and I read Futureland, and I was like, whoa, we can do this? We can write these kind of stories? Oh, okay. So that, 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 book, uh, that, that book always has a special place in my heart because of its fundamental impact on me as a writer. Um, Marlon James, uh, we talk, uh, talked about Toni Morrison being claimed by the literary set. Marlon James claimed by the literary set, but he's like, hey, you know what, I think I want to dabble in some spec fic myself. Um, so he has a trilogy beginning with uh, Black Leopard, Red, Red Wolf, uh, as he, uh, him wrestling with the, the fantasy series. Now we're back to Janelle Monet, though. So we talked about her in music, then we talked about her in film. Wouldn't you know, she launches a book earlier this year, 
called the memory librarian and other stories from Dirty Computer. So that, again, back, so Dirty Computer was a, 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 an album, then became an emotion picture, and now a, a collection of short stories uh, which builds on, on that world, which was released the same month as Sweep of Stars, my book. Um, dang on it, timing. <laughs> but even I bought copies of, uh, <laughs> of, of the memory library number. Who was I fooling? Um, I will mention my book, Sweep of Stars. We'll probably come back to that uh, during the Q&A a bit. But and this is, again, it's a space opera that follows this pan-African intergalactic community and its struggles to maintain their identity and freedom as they face challenges from within and from without. So, but again, it starts with that space of what could the world look like built on our terms? That's, that's the springboard of the, of the book. Just what does it look like on our terms? How do we dream about possibilities? What could systems look like? You know, if, if we do it outside of the shadow of this history of oppression and, and these oppressive systems, what could things look like? Because we start with a, I mean, I'm a writer. I start with a blank page, meaning anything is possible, right? Anything is possible. I can have starships powered by jazz music, because I can, and did. So there's that. Um, and then we'll talk briefly about film. Um, I think I, I left some uh, uh, on the resource pages. I, I had a list of movies that we talk about. Um, I mentioned Sun Ra's, uh, you know, Space is a Place. You know, just sort of, you know, you go through you know, some of the seminal things. Uh, Brother from Another Planet, um, Get Out, uh, Pumsy. We've talked about Black Panther, Sorry to Bother You. But I mean, Lovecraft Country, these are the sort of things that we look into the world of film that, that we're seeing uh, Afrofuturism start to, to rear its head and get the, uh, and draw this attention, this aesthetic, not just aesthetic, but this recognition, I mean, even us, us as a market, frankly, um, but this, this whole idea of like, we have different stories we can tell. So let's tell those stories. Um, but rather than just go and, and uh, jump in through uh, all, all these different films, I did want to talk a little bit about this whole idea of Afro-pessimism versus Afro-futurism, right? And so, and it's, it's, it's a similar discussion to the, what, a, a dystopia versus a utopia. This is that same sort of vein. Um, but I always see Afro-pessimism and Afro-futurism uh, as in this conversation with, with one another. Um, and I say that because, so Afro-pessimism is that dystopian model. Think of it that way. Afro-pessimism is that dystopian model, which is uh, a lot of times the default state the black, of black communities if, uh, as a mirror of the present reality, frankly. Um, and some might argue that uh, you know, these stories rely too heavily on dystopia or this, this trauma reaction to white supremacy. Um, Adrian Marie, uh, yeah, Adrian Marie Brown, uh, she wrote this. Octavia understood that these are the conditions that emerge when we are trapped in the imagination of racists, fundamentalists, and smart people addicted to hierarchy, people who don't think of the whole. We have to claim the space to imagine ourselves beyond this world. Right, so the fail failures of, uh, of our societal systems, you know, and our all too human condition, you know, this has to be interrogated through our art. And that's what uh, I believe Afro-pessimism does so well. You know, we have uh, artists that capture these stories, that analyze characters and the, and these journeys. But even, even when I think about uh, Parable of the Sower, I mean, people st stay locked into that whole, uh, into the dystopian nature of that work. But what's at its heart? At the heart is Lauren, this character who's this agent of chains, an agent of hope, who's going on her journey, and her journey ultimately is spreading this message of, of hope to change the world. And so, that, and so I think a lot of these stories, I mean, Parable of the Sower, An Unkindness of Ghosts, if you want to read uh, River Solomon uh, and have your heart you know, duly ripped out, uh, and, and so much of their work just rips out your heart. Uh, even from Get Out to Us, you know, these dystopian stories, they speak to our resilience. You know, we see these characters maintain their agency. We see them assuming these adaptive postures as they go through the trials and tribulations of the story they find themselves in. And like I said, for, uh, to overcome the way society main, remains unequal, there has to be visions of the future where these problems are, are solved. And that's Afrofuturism. 
And so our, our goal here might be best aimed to at, at creating these possible, at a possible utopia, you know, the, the idea of us reaching for this dream, waiting to be imagined into existence, right? That's what we do, you know? So we write these characters who embody, you know, on the one hand, we have characters who are embodying, you know, this, this resilience and all that, but in Afrofusion, we, we, we build on that, and we have these characters that are uh, embodying these n new principles, new ways of being, new ways of doing, stories of joy and thriving, you know, th stories that, uh, where we've arrived at the promised land that, uh, that those who are in the, the dystopia are persevering toward, right? The dream of the utopia are, is visions of the future. It's visions of future hope. All right. Then there's Afro-surrealism, which I won't talk much about. Um, <laughs> To, except to say this. So uh, let me define Afro, uh, Afro surrealism for a start, okay? So um, Afro surrealism is uh, expressing the absurdity of life in a racist society by embracing the disturbing and the bizarre. Uh, so Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man, for example, could, uh, could be considered one of the earliest uh, uh, and most famous uh, Afro surrealist works in literature. Um, writer and director Terrence Nance, he had a sketch show called uh, Random Acts of Flyness. Uh, which uh, the New York Times described as <laughs> kaleidoscopic and uh, nearly unclassifiable. That sounds about right. Um, in Get Out, we see uh, Jordan Peele wrestling with this idea of the sunken place. Uh, but uh, the, my prototypical example of, uh, of Afro-surrealism is going to be Sorry to Bother You. Y'all, I was not ready for that movie. Right, right here. So I was watching this movie. I, I'd arranged one of my uh, Afro Future uh, Friday discussion events. We're like, hey, let's watch uh, Sorry to Bother You Together. Yeah. Sure, we'll watch it in this church. And sure, church, invite your church folks to it. And uh, so that did not end well. Uh, but the movie ended great. Um, but uh, that church is still not talking to me. Um, but... <laughs> Um, I say all this uh, and go, you know, we've looked at m music, we've looked at literature, we've looked at film, and, and you know, if I start diving into, you know, what, is the, what does Afrofuturism look like in architecture? What does it look like in visual art or dance or fashion? I mean, we'd be here all night, right? But I want to recap where we are right now. So Afrofuturist art is the intersection of the black cultural lens, technology, liberation, and imagination. No, it bridges the past and the future in order to critique the present. It's about remembering. It's about resilience. It's about resistance. And it, cr it creates awareness, it raises consciousness, and maps out potential futures. But it begins with a, this journey this, of self-discovery and exploring black identity. It involves this radical, radical imagination as we break about systematic baggage, right? So one thing I've learned, being the resident Afrofuturist at the Kepler Institute, is like, you know, if we're doing this community organizing work, or in fact, any struggle where we're trying to break apart systematic baggage, you know, no matter where you find yourself and how you're doing it, you're, the totality, the immensity of what you're up against, you know, looms so large, it can sometimes feel hopeless, right? Um, you'll have many, well, you, I have had many dark nights of the soul, you know, when I lay awake wondering, you know, what is the point? You know, we get to these moments where we're just tempted to give up. And the only thing that keeps us going is this living hope. You know, we're constantly, we're, we're, we're asking, you know, what future do we want to see? We want to imagine these alternate uh, tomorrows. We do this work that's a radical imagining, a radical reimagining. We do future thinking. Um, me and my family, we practice Kwanzaa. And uh, on the last day of Kwanzaa, we celebrate this principle called Imani, which means faith. And it means that, Imani means to believe with all of our hearts and our people, our parents, our teachers, our leaders, and the righteousness and victory of our struggle. And it too points to this idea of a living hope that informs and infuses us. You know, sometimes life is about imagining the possibilities of what could be. You know, believing in, in, in the promise that things could just be better. Just be. Um, believing in that promise 
just as a part of recognizing our humanity is realizing that we also simply deserve to be. You know, no matter what that looks like, we deserve to live and we deserve to dream. And again, I'll say, daring to dream of a better future is the first act of resistance. So the hope that's inspired by Afrofuturism keeps us from despair. But in order to create that radical change, we have to be able to envision it. Right? We have to create space to imagine. We have to create that space to dream of possibilities, to dream of future hopes. And we have to join together to build that better tomorrow. Imagining pathways of healing for our future. That is the hope of Afrofuturism. That's the hope that infuses our community work. Uh, and it reminds me of this quote from Octavia Butler in Parable of the Sower. All that you, ch all that you touch you change. All that you change changes you. The only lasting truth is change. God is change. So go forth and be the change. Thank you. Should I take some questions? Would you like to take questions? I can take some questions. And if so, I've got a mic for the recording. Yeah, great. So if someone were interested in sort of getting their toes into like starting reading or listening to things related to Afro Afrofuturism, where would you recommend that they start? Ooh. Um, a good primer would be um, <sighs> Mothership. It was a, a book that came out from uh, Rosarian Publishing and uh, it's, it's like a Afrofuturism sampler plate. So a lot of the, lot of the um, man, a lot of the Afrofuturist writers are, are in that one. I'm not in it because I turned in my story late. But otherwise, it's a great collection. Um, but yeah, I'd probably start with Mothership. Um, if there's individual art, uh, authors, I would probably, I mean, I'm always going to default to uh, uh, N.K. Jemisin. Um, uh, if you, uh, you could warm up with her collection, actually, um, how, long to, how Long Till Black Futures Month. I believe, yeah, uh, in that collection. That'd be another good starting spot, so. We just um, had an active uh, discussion about Pimp My Airship, um, huh? uh, and Sleepy featured heavily mm. in our conversation. His, the arc, and there might be other questions from people who were there. Um, but the arc of his character's journey mm -hmm. from like just wanting to check out in the ways that he wanted to check out versus taking responsibility for being the voice mm -hmm. and the spark of the revolution was really powerful. Um, and I saw your, your use of language and metaphor as doing that throughout the book mm -hmm. um, in phrases like unperson and bringing in so many cultural references yeah. um, and historical references. Can you talk more about um, that framing practice as po it, whether it's poetic or just as a writer or as an activist or yeah. an Afrofuturist? Thank you. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So um, actually, Pim My Irish was a difficult book for me to write. Yeah. Um, and one of the reasons, one of the many reasons, was, uh, um, like I said, I, I'd actually come up as a horror writer. Um, and I first started writing, the, the Pit My Ship is actually the novelization of a story I first wrote in 2009. And so, uh, even when I was writing that story, I was just like, this is going to take me in a different direction. In fact, I even got halfway through Pit My Airship, the novel, and just like, I don't know if I can do this, because I, people know me as this, but this book, well, one, will take me in a different direction career-wise, but two, I mean, this is fundamentally where I am right now as a creative. So, Pit My Airship is actually, so here's the thing. I ultimately, I write for me first, and so Pit My Airship was a novel that wasn't even meant to be published. It was something I was trying to work out for myself. 
I'd come to a, a spot in my, in my life and in my career, and I'm just, I'm trying to, I was rethinking, reimagining my life and what it could be, and I was just like, but I'm just a writer. How can I use that gift to change, to impact my community, to impact the world around me? I don't even know what that even means, much less what it could look like. So I start working on yeah. Pimp My Airship and, and, and model this through, through Sleepy. So Sleepy is my stand-in for like, hey, this is where I'm at, but you know, what does it look like to evolve into being a voice, to, to use your gift uh, in ways that impact the world around you? And so I work all that out in the novel and I'm like, oh, wait a second, I now have a blueprint for myself. And so that's when my life changed and I started working for community organizations, much like Sleepy ends up getting involved with. That actually becomes my roadmap for how I end up doing the thing. So yeah, that's uh, just me working things out in real time. <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. I know there were several things that the group was like, oh, I wish we could ask. Okay, so I read Pit My Airship, and I thought it was really interesting how, like, in the first half of the books, I guess Sleepy doesn't really consider himself, like, the voice or, like, this this passion, like, this person for revolution, yeah. But I think it's really interesting that, like, it's very obvious that in the first half of the book, his poems, like, move other people, and, like, other people are seeing his talent. So, like, how do you feel like you see that reflect, like, in your black community or in your community, how, like, there are probably tons of black people maybe around you who aren't aware of their potential to like be Afrofuturist and like what they can contribute to the movement. Well, they don't stay that way long. <laughs> so, uh, so I mean, sleepy, sleepy struggle is real. Yeah. I mean, I'm sitting there, even when I was hearing my own introduction, I'm just like, who, is, who are they talking about? Grab, I, I think that's me. And, uh, and so, uh, you know, so something I very much wrestle with, I, mean, I've, I just feel Sleepy's pain, pain throughout. Um, but, then, but there are a couple of things. So one, actually I'm reminded about, one of the things I'm reminded of is, uh, is my book launch event for, for Sweep of Stars. So my, my publisher was like, uh, you have to do a book launch event. And I'm like, okay, um, I'll, I'll do a book launch event. Uh, I will caution you though that I have this reputation of being over the top. Is that all right? They're like, we don't know what that means, so sure. <laughs> okay. Um, and then I, I don't plan my book launch event. My community of fellow artists plan the book launch event. I, I, was like, I just turned over to them and was like, hey, I have to do this book launch. I don't know what to do with it. Can you all help me dream this thing into existence? And so that's what they do. And so um, I get choked up, just excuse me. Um, so I, I turned over to them, and so as my book launch event, hey, we, we end up getting this entire, um, uh, it's called the AMP, but it's basically this, uh, sort of like this food hub of like, uh, like a couple dozen restaurants. I mean, that's the kind of space we're talking about. So we, but we, they, the, the AMP itself donates the space to us for like 100 bucks. Like for 100 bucks, take our entire building. You can have all of it. Um, the, uh, they, they, uh, the artists say, hey, we're going to have different galaxies. Everybody gets their own universe in this space. So, Maurice, you have your sweep of stars universe. And so we want you to do a visual curation of what that means. And then we had a, a, a couple other artists. We had like a couple of hip-hop artists, a spoken word artist, an, an R&B artist. Um, and they each, each had to set up their own universe. And, and they were all given 15 minutes. But the caveat to their universe is they had to showcase some other artistic side of themselves that the community doesn't know about. So like the open mic poet, he, she showed his, he displayed his photography. No one knew that about him. The hip hop artist showed, uh, displayed his artwork that he'd been doing on the side that no one knew about, right? Um, and then the, 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 open, the poet uh, who was the, the head curator of all of this, um, she's, she organizes a fashion, a fashion show. So <laughs> each person gets 15 minutes to, to talk about themselves and then the fashion show ensued and she got several folks from the community to dress up in Afrofuturist garb um, and then they did one lap around the space and then they all did a quick change so they then uh, uh, dressed up as characters from my book, posing with my book. Um, and then the artist, she w did a gesture, which was m to call me up to the stage. And so then I had to walk 
through, the, through a forest of my own characters <laughs> to get to the stage. Um, and so by the time I get to the stage and I'm looking out and I'm seeing this space that's filled with a couple hundred folks from my community. And I, don't, I, I barely even get through my own reading of my own work um, because it would just hit me so much. But then when I leave the stage, a, 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 another artist pulls me aside and she says, Maurice, have you taken this in? Your community has come around you. We're here to support you because of the work you do in community. And so that's something I sit with for a start. I sit with that. But then even as I'm going through and, and you know, and I think about what is it I do, you know, I'm like, I don't, I don't really see that I do, I, don't, I can't see what I do. That's why I surround, that's why I am in community because sometimes we have these blind spots about ourselves, right? And so, I mean, even I just came back from this convention uh, where, uh, you know, we have the, we all find it difficult to talk about ourselves, right? And so we started this practice of like, you know what, I, I mean, I get it, you can't talk about you, but I can talk about you. I can talk about the gift that you are to this community and the, and the value that you bring, one as an artist and one that you bring and that you impact, how you impact the people around you. And so we just sort of made that our practice. You know, we speak for one another and speak that truth of who we are to one another. And we just make that our practice, our communal practice of just moving through the space. And I don't know if this gets to uh, the answer of, of your question, but I'm just like, this is, this is the practice. This is the work. And I'm glad to be a part of it. <laughs> I don't know if this is a question so much as a comment, but I guess I started, I was reading Afrofuturism and I didn't know it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so with uh, N.K. Jameson um, and, and then uh, Octavia Butler, I, you know, I just, I, I didn't know it. And then yours. And um, for me, it, it became kind of eye-opening that, oh yeah, <laughs> you know, it's like, all these, you know, you know, hundreds of years, you know, you, you've been forced to look at everything through the white perspective, and so it's been very interesting to really have it through the black perspective. Um, and, and one of the things I, I mentioned in our book discussion was sometimes even reading, reading your book, it felt like almost like picking up at times like Shakespeare or uh, Jane Austen where it was like a, a, just a little bit different language. Mm -hmm. And so I had to get used to it. So I guess my question is, what has your response been uh, from the white community? And because I think it's, I, I think it's really important to be able to imagine our future. Mm -hmm. But but you know, we, we spent our like Star Trek's great. Yeah. But you know, it, it's great. But still, everything was like, okay, so we'll put a black person here or this person here. It's from the white perspective. Right, right. So now it's it's a really interesting time in our life to get books. And, I, and now, now that I buy them from Amazon, I get all these other authors like uh, Blood and, oh, what was it called? Blood and Bones. I don't, oh, it's Children, Children of Blood and Bones. Love, love that book. Okay, so it's like interesting to really, really read a book from the perspective of the, of the black person. Right. Because it's different. It's different. It's not just a black person being put in a white show. Right. Yeah. So, the, I so one. I love world building. That's my favorite part of writing. So if I if I ever do in a workshop, I'm only I only do two different kinds of workshops, like world building or dialogue. Those that's like in writing. That's the only two things I'm good at. Um, and so, but with Sweep of Stars, I spent about probably a year and a half doing the world building for that book. Right, and, and but the world building, it wasn't me doing a bunch of, it, I mean, yeah, I was researching, but the research looked different. It, was, it looked a lot like me going to my neighbors and saying, what could things look like? And so, what is, and so the research was me just dreaming alongside my neighbors. You know, if we had a blank page, what could education system look like? If we had a, black, uh, a blank page, you know, what could a, an economic system look like? You know, what, what are the values and principles that we could move by? Um, that would be, you know, if, we, if things were left, if we could create them from scratch, you know, what could these things look like? 
Um, and that was part of the fun of writing Sweep of Stars, is just that whole process of just dreaming alongside folks. And, and by doing it together, um, one, I'm working out my book. Two, uh, they're now forced to think about, wait, what does things look, what am I working towards? You know, the work that I'm doing now, what does it look like 100 years from now? Um, what are we working towards? If, you know, what would, you know, if, you know, I have some food, friends who work in food justice, you know, what does that look like? What, if, if you win, what does it look like? What could, how could things be different if, you, if we win? And, uh, and that was sort of the thought exercise behind all of Sweep of Stars, was to just, just to be able to do that. Um, here, I, I think I lost the thread of your question. Yeah, do you? Oh, I know. Hang on. I got, I got something else. Okay. Now, I, I, it just took me a second. But the whole doing it from a, a non-Western centered paradigm yeah. is yeah. tough. And, and here's what I mean by that. You know, I'm, I'm, writing, I'm, I'm writing this out. And then, and then, you know, as I'm building these systems, and I'm even having conversations uh, with folks, and it's like, well, ha, uh, you know, if we're, how do we build these systems that isn't a reaction to trauma? And, and, yeah. and, but part of the answer is, what, did we just erase history? Because that trauma is, has informed us. It's in our DNA. It has impact. So, okay, all right, so we put that here. Um, it doesn't mean we can't dream, though, right? It j but we have to acknowledge that is part of it. And so that becomes part of the world building its own self. Um, and, and there's a timeline in a... Uh, in the front of the book, and it'll talk about this period of just healing that has to happen to free us up to uh, to deal with that history, to get to carve out that space to where like we got to heal on, uh, so much just to be able to be able to dream again on our terms. Um, so there's that, but then it's the whole idea of like, all right, so if this is going to not not center Western, if it's not going to center the West, I mean, I got to do a fine tooth comb, uh, go, you know crawl through to go, all right, wait, that was a, you know, a Western unit of measurement, or that was a Western idiom, or that was a Western phrase, and, I, and I'm like, no, I got to get all of these out um, in order to, to and, and it's an interesting exercise to see how much is just ingrained in us naturally that was like, man, I got to wrestle with that. Well, and because you were forced, that you turn on the TV, it was all white, you know, and you read science fiction, mm -hmm. white writers, so that was ingrained in you where it's interesting to, I love that now I can start having ingrained in me, and of course it's, it's choice, it's right. not from trauma, but right. to see if they're going Right. Well, and it's an interesting because you asked about the reaction from, from white readers, and uh, I remember when I first, my first novel trilogy was called uh, The Knights of Breton Court. Uh, which was an urban fantasy series, and it was, uh, I pitched it as The Wire meets Excalibur. So it was my King Arthur in the Hood novel. And, uh, and one of the pushbacks I got from uh, a quite vocal element of Arthurian fandom, which apparently is now, is actually a thing. Um, but they were just like, well, I just felt like I was, you know, that wasn't my King Arthur, and I was just locked out of it due to language, and da 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 da, da. And I'm just like, okay, I could see that. Counterpoint, however. <laughs> How many of you right now speak Klingon? How many of you learned all of the elfish language when you were reading Lord of the Rings? Yeah. And I knew full well, people in that room, I'm like, and I know y'all, so y'all can't lie. I, I know this. Um, if, we, if I've done my job as a writer, though, I'm sucking you into that world regardless of language. Mm -hmm. Right? Uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I want to carry you on the, the tidal wave of character and story and just propel you through and like, yeah, you might have a, a new paradigm, a new story to have to, to wrestle with. That's okay. That's the work. Yeah, yeah. that's the work. That's the work. Yeah. That's the work. That's what I encourage my students of. Like, sometimes you have to read things that are technically above your grade level. But you know what? Wrestling with hard things is okay. Well, I know we're at time, yeah. um, and I think that there might be some uh, books that we could consider purchasing, uh, so we're going to be able to do that. But um, this was just such a treat, and I thank you so much for being here. Right, Let's you. give them one last round of applause. Thank you, Maurice. Thank you.